I was, I was reading an article the other day that I wanted to kind of use as a pinpoint on this conversation. And it's, uh, it actually came from a podcast, uh, Tim Ferriss podcast, and it was uh, a Seth Godin um, talking about quality and, and effort. And basically the, the thesis of this article was that you can work very, very hard, but if you don't have systems in place, um, you're kind of running on a hamster wheel. Um, you're the author of a book coming out, Growth Hacking for Dummies, and I'm, I'm sure that you believe in, in systems, but would love to hear your thoughts on that. How important are systems to being successful in your personal and professional life? Uh, I, in fact, I am a process guy at heart. Uh, so I'm a firm believer in systems uh, because really growth, whether it's personal or professional, I think is about finding what works. Uh, and you have to have a systematic method for identifying what that is. Uh, and when you tie that uh, method uh, to a very measurable outcome, and it's not about output, it's about an outcome that you know, hopefully is positive and you know, one that delivers value, whether it's to yourself, people around you, customers, whatever that may be. Uh, I think that fuels uh, the process with purpose. And, and, and I think that sometimes is missed is that every system and every process is in the service of something. And hopefully that something is something good. Uh, so, you know, process plus purpose, you know, with, I, I think leads to really positive outcomes. Uh, you know, if I can use that all alliteration. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, um, uh, and, uh, you know, e even when we were at, uh, you know, at Growth Hackers, and this is something I took away, you know, Anna, is that every business exists to, you know, deliver value to its customers. And, you know, we've always, uh, uh, measured that value through the lens of this thing called the North Star metric. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's always, and that can be a, you know, for a business, it's whatever you do to your customers for yourself. It can be, you know, some level of self-improvement, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, you have to find out what that thing is. And it, it takes a deliberate effort to, you know, understand where the opportunity is or where the biggest opportunities or maybe even the biggest roadblocks uh, to growing that value exists. Uh, and without a, a systematic process, there's no way you'll get to that end goal, uh, I think, fast enough for it to make any sort of difference. For sure. Um, it kind of reminds me of, I told you I've taken the uh, Reforge uh, growth model, the growth series, um, and Brian Balfour talks about how kind of like growth is just an output and all of these other things are inputs. Um, and so company growth um, or any type of growth is, is the result of a series of, of things. It doesn't just, it's not something you create. It, it, it's, it's a byproduct of, um, of a more systematic approach of a, a lot of different inputs. Oh, for sure. Uh, and, and I think this is maybe one of those things that, you know, uh, everybody who practices growth the way it was intended to be we will tell you that there is no silver bullet to growth. Um, and that, you know, it, it's, it's all about compounding returns. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can't do uh, things uh, that are, you know, do not build a sustainable business by doing things that themselves are not sustainable. Uh, <laughs> anyway, right? uh, which is where that, I have that cognitive dissonance, you know, with the negative connotation that, you know, growth hacking has, where people associate it, you know, with spammy tactics, uh, you know, or underhanded things when, you know, the entire premise of growth hacking is to build sustainable businesses. So how can you do something that, is unsustainable to build a sustainable business. So by definition, spammy stuff is not growth hacking. Right, 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 right. Um, how, how do you think about building that, that system then? Or what are, you know, there's obviously everybody has their own 
kind of idea of like what a growth model is or or how to grow um what are the functions of of a, a good a systematic approach to kind of building a, a growth model uh, yeah so i think to me everything stems from uh, motivations because if you don't understand what people really want out of you know whatever it is they're going to use uh, what is that you know bigger thing that you enable for them uh, there's no way for you to then provide that value and then any other conversation about growth models or you know, strategies is just it's meaningless uh, because then it's literally you're on a hamster wheel trying to provide growth for the sake of providing growth um, and uh, you know i think there's been i've been trying to understand more about you know how, how do you characterize value or what are the components of value to people right um, you know right because every you know product or service clearly has a you know functional benefit right you can get from a to b in some fashion and, and that's fine uh, uh, those are table stakes I, I, i've been trying to understand more about uh, you know how do you sort of get a better handle on needs uh mm -hmm. and uh, um you know clearly a lot of that comes from just talking to customers you know which is not rocket science but shocking how few people want to do it yeah <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and um the uh you know i think there's there's a context within which every uh, everything gets used and and the nuance that i've slowly begun to appreciate more is through the whole you know jobs to be done theory uh, which is that e even for a specific uh, tool or a product that context can change you know all the time um, you know and i'll give you a simple example of you know you see i'm holding a coffee mug mm -hmm. uh, i mean i filled it with coffee in the morning so that i could wake up and you know get productive um i filled it 2 minutes before our talk so you know i could be coherent <laughs> you know as to what i was saying um and i'm going to fill it again at night so i can stay awake and finish binge watching whatever else you know i'm, I'm going to be watching at night so it's still the same thing but the context mm -hmm. has changed quite a bit and and i think that's uh, probably incumbent on us more to understand what those contexts are which then starts to give us a much better sense of you know what this customer journey thing looks like uh and only then can we have a good idea about you know what's preventing people from experiencing the core value you offer and you know maybe experiencing it again uh because how else will you know where people truly fall off because you know it it's okay to start off with you know simplistic models like the r you know pirate metrics right or, or something like that which you know i i i do all the time when i'm starting off is just take a very step back take a very macro view mm -hmm. uh of it uh and at least try to get a sense of you know at least where people are dropping off more than others sure and then use that as the jumping off point to get more qualitative insights you know as to what's what's the true cause because you know at the end of the day your data is only going to tell you what happened it's never going to tell you why it happened which and i would argue that that is the more important thing to understand if you're going to be smart about understanding how to deliver value and how to grow value yeah i think um one of the one of the challenges with the r framework or, or any or any framework in in general is it's it's not personalized to an individual business's needs so a lot of times i feel like you have to define that customer journey a little bit differently depending on the type of company you are depending on the size of the company etc um one of the things that stuck out to me from what you were just saying uh talking about kind of user psychology and being empathetic to a user i think one of the challenges that um people in product people in engineering people in growth face is that a lot of times we're spending hours and hours a day um you know maybe living in ads manager maybe living in jira right um and we're developing these products and developing these solutions for for users 
um, where a lot of times we're not even really thinking about like, how are they going through the process? And we're more like, let's design this for them. And um, there's solutions for that, but like, how do you, how do you go about doing that? And then how do you also go about doing that knowing that this kind of effort is something that has to be coordinated between um, different teams and different employees within an organization. I think understanding users is not something that can be understood in silos. There has to be like a coordinated effort there. One hundred percent. And there is the the cliche out there that growth is a team sport. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which is really true. Um, and so, and this is where I have found real value in the idea of the North Star metric, right? Because this is a one number that is customer focused. Right? So, by definition. It's not about our internal metrics, you know, for the engineering team, it's not about how many bugs they quashed or for the product team, it's not about how many features they developed. Or for the sales team, it's not about how many leads they closed. Or for the marketing team, about how many MQLs, you know, happened in the week. Yeah. Right? All of this is important, but it's all in the service of growing value delivered. And to, to me, the power of this North Star metric is, is just that, is the ability for everybody in the company to ask themselves, what is it that I'm doing today uh, that moves the needle on value delivered? And if you have a wishy-washy answer, or if you find yourself sort of, you no know, padding your answer with a lot of busy work, you know, things, you're probably focusing on the wrong things. Right? And I think everybody should be able to articulate very clearly, you know, how what they do you know, helps grow value to their customers. Because if they don't, then that's a, you know, that's a leadership thing. Uh, that's clearly an internal education thing, uh, which leads to all of the sort of lack of customer empathy problems, you know, uh, you, know you, you were alluding to. And then, you know, we use the proxy of, oh, I'm in ads, oh, I'm in Jira, you know, as a way to fill up that space. Yeah, I think um, I think that those issues become exaggerated the larger that uh, the larger an organization becomes, the more teams that there are. Um, you know, I've I've been in companies. I'm company right now with with twenty people, um, and I'm com- I've been in companies with two hundred plus people. And the and when I was at like AdRoll, large SaaS platform where we have SDR team, account managers, um, seller, enterprise sellers, right the differences that exist like SDR is like I'm keeping my job and getting as many leads as possible account uh, sellers I want to upsell I want to upsell account managers I can't I have to retain I have to retain so there's these different um, things so I guess the question is if you are heading up growth um, how do you think about kind of like relaying that North Star metric if you're working at a smaller company where you might be the, you know, a head of growth in like a 15 person company, what's the difference if you're a head of growth at a 200 person company with these different functions? Oh, oh God, yes. Um, so I, I think almost nothing happens, no matter what size of company, uh, unless the CEO themselves is bought in that this is the way we, sh- we should and we need to operate from here on out. And which is, you know, we will take a very systematic approach to how we grow the business. It's not mm-hmm. about feelings and opinions. Uh, yes, all of the you know, leads and bugs and all of that matters. But if all of us starting tomorrow don't start caring about value to customers, this doesn't work. We will all fall apart. And, and like silos are the death knell uh, mm-hmm. for, 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 for growth. Um, and so I think that's step one, right? CEO has to be on board. Um, depending on the size of the company, you know, if there is really an executive management team, they are the next level of people that need to be brought on board because they will be the people that, you know, hold the keys to all the resources that are going to be needed for this cross-functional collaboration that's going to happen. Um, and some, sometimes it, it takes a while uh, to, to do this. And clearly all this is much easier the earlier you do it in a company's life because I mean, culture gets set reasonably quickly uh, and, you know, the bigger the company, the harder it becomes uh, to pivot around to this completely new way of operating. Not to say it can't be done. I mean, it it can and has been done. It just, it takes a more uh, sort of evolutionary approach in smaller parts of the business to prove it out before it starts getting adopted by other parts of the business. 
you know, in, in these larger companies. And, and this is something, you know, I've seen happen at Adobe, for example, uh, where their director of growth, there was no growth function. Uh, right. But the director of growth started with Adobe Spark, which was a new product, small product, you know, clearly nothing compared to the revenue, you know, generating machine that Photoshop, you know, even, even is today. But they were able to prove out that following a systematic methodology leads to amazing results for this. So can we now try this out in other products? And now they have growth teams for each of their products as a function of this. It took time, but right, they were able right. to prove it out one, one by one. And so now there's multiple growth teams and then they have a director of growth that sits on top of all of those growth teams to ensure overall coordination. Um, you know, or even with bigger companies like uh, Uber, uh, like they've got completely separate, you know, ac you know, rider acquisition, rider you know, acquisition yeah. right? They've got user acquisition, growth teams, retention is a completely different, but that's, you know, very few people or companies reach that sort of size. Uh, for most companies, and I think certainly one of the size you're at right now, you know, one team is probably good enough. Uh, and as long as that growth team includes all of the key stakeholders, in, which includes the CEO. Yep. So you know, your head of product, your head of marketing, sales, engineering, you know, if there's creative uh, analytics, whatever it may be. Uh, yep. Because you need the input of everybody so that everybody understands that when something happens, they need a very clear understanding of does this impact me? And if it does impact me, you know, do we all need to care about it and change how we do things or is it okay? Uh, and also because when you try to, you know, run all of these tests and experiments, you're going to need resources, right? You're going to need some, maybe some engineering resource, some creative resource, um, you know, a marketing resource, analytics resource. So, you know, initially there might be a lot of begging for resource. <laughs> until you sort of prove it out and get a dedicated growth team. But until then you're taking people's time away. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that takes a lot of planning because, you know, for product team, for example, you know, they have sprints planned so far in advance. Sure. You know, uh, so they need to know, okay, if you're running a test and you need a resource from my team, I need to plan for it for, you know, my future sprints. Uh, because otherwise this is the cause of tension when somebody just says, oh, we now have a growth team and now we're going to do these tests. And you're like, yeah, that's great. You can try. I don't have any resource to spare. Uh, and so, but what the growth team allows for is, uh, and is intended for is this very high level of collaboration and understanding that we are doing all of this testing in that service of growing value. And yes, we need this resource. Let's figure out how we can repurpose resources or reuse resources or, you know, take them away temporarily from one place to the other. And while it may impact other things, let's see how we can mitigate uh, the impact and and that's a, a huge source of tension which gets mitigated as a result of these cross functional uh, growth teams and uh, the other thing that it really helps with is uh, when you run all of these tests um sometimes you know you want all of these other key stakeholders as sort of gut checks and reality checks for yeah. the level of effort that is going to be needed to pull something off because yeah. you know, a marketing person doesn't quite know how much you know, product resource necessarily is needed or how much engineering resource might be needed for a minimum viable test or you know, whether they're going to need a design resource and how much time that's going to take. And so when you're sitting around and prioritizing all these tests you know, and somebody may say, I've, this is a super easy test to do. And yeah. if you have somebody from engineering saying, no, 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 this is... <laughs> not as easy as you think it is or you maybe want to do a test and the you know, head of brand says you know this is this may be a great test but this is completely off brand for us to be running a test this way you know here's an alternate suggestion for doing it you know or you know you might want to do a test but the product person says you know what we're already in implementing a feature like this so why don't you wait a little while and do some other test uh, you know first and so you wouldn't have those uh, sort of insights and everybody would sort of be running at cross purposes or maybe even, even if you're moving in the same direction, you're not rowing in the same direction, but you're sort of arrows sort of flying in the same general direction, but not yeah. parallel to each other. 
Yep. I mean, everything that you say just like necessitates the idea for kind of like consistent collaboration between these different functions instead of more siloed conversations where someone from marketing is talking to someone from product, but then the analytics isn't hearing, hearing that. Um, so that like coordinate, coordinated effort is, is so important. I mean, you know, I've been, I'm probably five years, six years into my career at this point. And um, I've, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of different things like SDR, SDR work, frontline, sending out those LinkedIn requests, right? Um, account management, um, now more acquisition marketing. And um, I look at kind of like the skill sets I've developed and there's stuff like, okay, you have to, look, you, know, you have to know how to create a campaign in, in Facebook, right? Um, you gotta write some, some good copy. But um, the way that I see the skill sets required to be a VP of growth or a CMO is really cross-functional. Can you get people to work together because you could be the best copywriter in the world, but like when you're, if you want to be an executive, I feel that my personal, from what I've seen, like you have to learn how to get people coordinated. Yes, and, and, and that, you know, leads to two points, right? And because one is your processes can be as, you know, detailed and as fancy as you want them to be. If people aren't going to follow them, it means nothing. It doesn't matter, yeah. Right, so any process that people don't follow is a bad process. Uh, so that's w one part. But also, secondly, it takes a certain kind of person uh, to be able to execute on the strategic priorities of a growth team. Uh, and I was actually able to do a little bit of research on this uh, as well, because everything I'd heard so far or read was very anecdotal. Like, oh, you need somebody who's analytical and you need somebody who's also creative. It's this wonderful blend of left brain and right brain. <laughs> it just felt really anecdotal and it, it felt strange that for a field that is so all about data, that there isn't data about, you know, what, what's, the, what's the right kind of characteristics for somebody who wants to do growth stuff? Uh, and so I, I was able to do an, in an initial small survey of uh, 31 different growth leads from around the world, companies of different sizes, uh, to understand work style patterns. And uh, it, it, all of this maps to exactly what we've been talking about, right? Is there's a certain kind of work style pattern which is hardwired to be an out of the box thinker. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a kind of person that will challenge the status quo, you know, w w versus I'll just do whatever, you know, we've been doing. Right. Right. Which, again, not to say that that second kind of person is necessarily bad, you know, especially if that person recognizes and has self-awareness of, you know, where their strengths don't lie so that they can then maybe supplement or complement themselves with other kinds of people that do have those strengths. Right, uh, but clearly it becomes easier when you have somebody at the helm who's just, you know, just going to go for it versus going to wait for consensus and everybody's all happy about life before we'll take another step. Uh, so that that's sort of one kind of characteristic that you know popped up in my research. Um, an another one is you know there's a level of doggedness and you know resilience that you need to just keep going at it week after week mm -hmm. because, I mean. I'm sure you run tests with your acquisition, uh, you know, sort of efforts all the time. And, you know, most tests fail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, but again, failure is learning, right? It's not failure. Uh, but th there's also the reality that, it, you know, after test, after test, after test, after test that keeps failing, it can get pretty demoralizing, you know, for a bit. I mean, you sort of get caught up in this little funk. You're like, like nothing I do works. I, you know, I must be the only donkey on the planet <laughs> who can't get, you know, this needle to move. Um, but, you know, it takes a certain kind of, uh, you know, hardwired resilience to be able to just keep going at it no matter what. And, you know, say, okay, the data says this doesn't work. That's fine. I'm going to do something else and I'm going to do something else. And I'm, genuinely excited at the prospect of trying new things again and again because there are many people who are not excited by that idea and they want and they're very comfortable and their strength lies in doing the same thing day in and day out yeah so this, is, this is not about better this is just about what is you know 
seems to be something that's more suited to this kind of a role. Um, and uh, the third sort of pattern I found was, of course, you know, what we were just uh, alluding to, which is this whole leadership quality, right? is this ability to persuade. And persuading doesn't mean my opinion matters. It's rather persuading everybody about this is the best course of action, you know, for our company. Right. And, and if, you know, somebody else has that idea, then persuading the company about that is the best idea. It's not about, you know, the ego satisfaction of, you know, whatever I say goes. Uh, and so you need all of these sort of characteristics to come into play if you're going to have, you know, high odds of executing on a, a growth program successfully. Um, I have to admit, I, I definitely, once I made that change from working in sales to working on more of the growth side of things, I realized this is much more for me because I'm a very experimental person. I'm all about routines. I'm all about like, like I love marathon training, right? I like, this is, this is the plan that we're going to get on for this next six months. I love doing little projects and little tests. So um, even in my own life, like I'm going to meditate for 30 days and then I'm going to track how I feel to see mm. what changes it has to my mental state. Um, so I love that type of stuff. Uh, a few minutes, a few minutes left. Um, I kind of want to completely transition and spend like the last five minutes ask, asking specifically about marketing stuff because I am a marketer um, and I, I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on this. Um, so, you know, you have, you have a startup, you have a, a you know, call it a, a $10 million annual budget, right? Um, performance marketing. Um, how do you think about allocating budget across different channels and ex experimenting on different channels, whether that be, you know, the, the paid social side of things, search, um, out of home, radio, podcast. I I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts about kind of like how you think about the distribution of budget between those different channels, because that's something that I think, of, uh, think about a lot. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, yeah. So you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of stealing ideas. So I'm going to tell you something absolutely. <laughs> uh, um, um, and, and this actually comes from, uh, mostly from Brian Balfour. Uh, okay. And it's a long time back, he'd come up with this prioritization matrix for channels, uh, which I, I think was in a post called How to Become a Customer Ac Acquisition Expert. I okay. Uh, okay. Right. Um, and um, the only bit of incompleteness with that um, uh, with that post was you know his example had only a few channels you know in it uh, and but the the sort of key insight from his uh, post uh, was that you know you have different uh, sort of variables that you need to test through or take into account for every channel uh, and uh, this is everything from, you know, sort of how much does it cost to play in this channel? Like, you know, and, and he had a very system, uh, very easy system of ranking uh, any of these variables as low, medium or high. So just so you didn't get bogged down by it. Mm -hmm. right. And so his f five or six variables were sort of what is the cost of playing in this channel? Uh, what, what is your ability to target uh, your ideal customers within this channel? Uh, what is the... Uh, ability of control you have to turn experiments on and off really quickly within a particular channel. Yeah. Um, how, you know, quickly, you know, could you get experiments launched in, a, in any specific channel? Uh, how quickly could you see results from the experiments uh, of a particular channel? And sort of what is the, what is the scale sort of, of your target market that you could reach uh, within that channel? And you can go through this exercise for pretty much every uh, channel there is, and you can get the list of channels from you know the traction book, uh, for you know by Justin Maris and uh, Gabriel Weinberg, right? So there's whatever those 19 traction channels, and you can layer on this prioritization matrix right. through them, um, and you can go a step further uh, because you know to really because once you go through this exercise, you'll immediately see some channels that you know have a higher potential than others. Uh, because, you know, in, in an ideal world, right, you would have low cost, really high ability to target, you know, really high levels of control to turn experiments on and off, uh, you know, really low amount of time to get experiments launched, really low amount of time to see results, but also really, you know, high ability to, you know, 
a tie or really scale this channel as well. Clearly, no channel in the real world is going to meet all of these, you know, benchmarks. But you'll see some that are closer than others. Right. Uh, and uh, at that point, it's a matter of then trying to figure out, okay, if if there's a certain channel, let's say it's content marketing, uh, or even let's say you, you do a lot of ads. So let's say it's mm -hmm. you know social ads. Um, given this you know, my particular scenario. So let's say even if, you know, every other benchmark is met, but the cost is high, right? But I'm like this new startup and I don't have budget, right? Even though it pretty much meets every benchmark, maybe that's not the one for me and I'm going to find the right. next best one, which has maybe lower cost. Right? So it's not necessarily being a dogmatic about this is the closest to the real world, perfect ideal scenario. It's once you've found two or three that come close, then it's about what, what can you realistically play in, in those two or three based on, you know, you know it, they may be low cost, but you know, you may have no resource to, you know, create the kinds of tests that are needed within that right. channel. Like I know, no, like I don't have any Snapchat expertise, like, you know, the, the cost can be as low as it you know, wants to be, but if I can't even launch a test, it's useless. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think that, so I use that as a lens to drill down on which is the most realistic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last uh, sort of step I follow is um, sort of try to understand, you know, the characteristics So each channel has its own characteristics, right? Some are by definition sort of more longer term plays. Some are uh, channels that, you know, pe pe people's behavior is more um, uh, sort of spontaneous in the in certain channels where, you know, sure. versus others. Yeah. And I think I'd, I'd like to align sort of, you know, what, what is the, you know, is my product something that's an easy, spontaneous thing as well mm -hmm. that people can, you know, engage with or buy with, or is it something that takes consideration? So I want to sort of align uh, the behavior that it takes to finally engage with my product with that of the channel that I have a realistic shot of playing in. And that itself also then provides, uh, you know, an additional level of filtering, which inevitably leads you to just one or two channels that are most ideal for you to then start experimenting in. Something that I uh, learned at Rally, um, last, last year we were driving a lot of new users and I was just driving really low cost per install, um, but not really converting a lot of, of those folks into investors. Um, and what I realized is that there, were, there was kind of a, a lack of information in our product on answering the questions of how it works, why should you invest, what's the financial data behind it. And so I changed and I thought about the customer journey, more so from just like, how do we get them to install, but how do we get them to become an investor? And what content do we have to show them along the way? This led to building a, a much more segmented retargeting strategy where in the first seven days of them installing, they're getting more information about how Rally works. Um, later on, they're getting more information about you know the the financial benefits and and I think about I think it's so important to think about like the information, how to give it, when to give it, and how much to give it because people, if you're going to try to sell me with a one minute long video on a Facebook ad or Instagram ad, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. You know, you might be able to to do something like that on YouTube, maybe other other platforms um but like be 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 empathetic to you know if i'm scrolling really quick i need three seconds but if i'm on quora and i'm kind of in a discovery you want to read a little bit maybe i can write a little bit more 100 percent, right i think I, this is why you know i i think that uh you know the advice of you know go where your customers are i think that's great but that's still very incomplete because yeah. <laughs> a lot of what is implicit in it is a lot of this about how do people behave in that channel, uh, right? Which is as important as not, not only, uh, you know, what kind of ads maybe you can serve up, but then what is that next first experience that they have when they hit your product, right? Because, you know, and this was almost, you, know, you want, it to be sort of the holy grail, right? That everybody has the most ideal experience and maybe a more personalized experience based on where they came from. Right. Right. And where they are in their journey, if there's a way to even determine that. But 
it should it shouldn't be the case even though it is just because it's the reality of budgets and stuff like that that you know somebody who comes from a 15 second experience to your product might need maybe a little bit more on the back end with in terms of their first experience on product you know versus somebody who did, who took a more considered approach by reading a multiple quora responses and yeah. are further along mentally and don't need to be resold all over again on their first experience they just want to get in and say okay i'm 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 primed i'm i'm almost sold you know, let, let me in uh, right so which is why i think you know you you can't think about uh, you know marketing separately from product because that that just that has never made sense to me is because if all you care about is i'm getting you to my site or my app and leads in i'm done you know give me my paycheck mm -hmm. you, know, uh, <laughs> you know versus you know if we would just tweak that uh, script with okay yes you care about leads but maybe you know how about retained leads right uh, you know because that alone will i think change so much about how you message and where you message you know to find these kinds of people who have higher odds of continuing to use your product yeah for sure um cool well i have i have a meeting in in 20 minutes so i i want to end here um thank you so much anush for uh giving me the opportunity to interview you and, and and chat with you uh where can people go to to find you and um yeah give me a give me a little spiel about growth hacking for dummies yeah so i'm on twitter at anuj adhia keeping it really simple you know, my first name and last name uh, on linkedin as well i'm probably the only one with my name on LinkedIn, and if there are more, I'm the only one who's smiling in their profile <laughs> picture. You're very happy in your profile. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, gr gr Growth Hacking for Dummies uh, came out of a couple of needs for myself. This is actually a book written for myself five years ago um, because there was no Growth Hacking 101 uh, when I joined Growth Hackers. And while I had the benefit of working with Sean Ellis, I and he speaks very plainly, I still had to translate that into somebody who had zero context, you know, mm -hmm. and really plain English. Uh, and so th this was my attempt at writing that 101 for anybody else who begins that journey, just like I did, you know, all that time ago. Uh, and the second reason was uh, more from a little bit of frustration that after all this time, there's still so much misunderstanding you know, or controversy or misconceptions about what it truly is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it's unfortunate that a lot of the people who do practice growth the way it's meant to be, uh, they either don't talk about it or talk about it as often as I would like them to. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and so th this was sort of like an optimistic attempt at trying to stem some of that tide of negative association and connotation that there is that, you know to show that it, it really is about a process it's not about you know the flavor of the month it's not about you got to be on TikTok and you got to be you know you have to implement these 300 you know tips to increase your conversion rate by 800 percent right <laughs> all, all of that exists within your specific context and yes all of that information can be useful but it's most useful when you can understand for yourself where your greatest growth needs are and then absorb the right amount of information you know at the right time from whatever source makes the most sense uh, to you and i just hadn't seen anything that provided that just that base context setting for anybody not familiar with the topic and um when does it come out uh, so in theory, it comes out on April 14th, uh, 2020, uh, Amazon willing uh, and, you know, uh, COVID-19 willing because a lot of the uh, you know, Amazon warehouses aren't storing anything other than medical and home supplies right now uh, for obvious right. reasons, but still should be available on Kindle on that day. Uh, so, you know, I, I think people who are familiar with the topic, you know, may find something new just in uh, that somebody else is talking about uh, growth in the more process and sustainable manner, uh, you know, in, in, in a book and may even find something new in terms of the research on characteristics of growth leads. 
which they might not have seen before. Uh, but for people who are not familiar with it, uh, you know, I, I think uh, th this will provide the foundation that you know they can uh, be the people that can uh, uh, be the cheerleaders of implementing a growth program within their company. Mm -hmm. I uh, I look forward to uh, to reading it in a in a few months. Um, cool. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, have a good day and uh, stay safe. All right.